So today, we're going to start a new theme. And the theme this month is based on the class that I'm going to teach, and that is health and wholeness. And so it's really looking at how do we become expressions of healing and health and wholeness in every area of our life, in our mind, in our body, and in all our affairs. We're going to be looking at this month primarily the teachings of our co-founders, Myrtle and Charles Fillmore. And that's because this entire international ministry that has been in existence for over 100 years started as a journey of healing. And so we'll be looking at their teachings as well as historical and contemporary master teacher, teachers like Jesus, of course, and others. And so what we are going to do this month is develop for ourselves an understanding of our own, if you will, healing theology. We're going to understand our own way of engaging and stepping into these teachings of healing. And part of what my hope is, is that we all will become what we are, and that is heart-centered metaphysicians. We like to use that term in unity, and the metaphysician, the metaphysical is about really understanding that life is more than the physical, that there's a way in which we can engage with the physical world to change the circumstances by changing our thinking and our feelings and changing the way we understand the world around us, that we are not slaves to this world, that we are not just cogs in the wheel, but we have this divine power within that we can bring to any situation to be victorious. I had something planned for this week to start off our week and um, our month. And of course, as spirit should have it, you know, that's a very interesting week for me. And many things happening um, in my household in particular that made me really feel like I, I was called to really speak on some things this month and speak on some things today. And so today I'm going to be talking about spirituality and mental health. Now, we don't talk a lot necessarily in churches about mental health. And even in unity, you know, we've done so much to be able to promote this idea of, you know, thoughts in mind are held in kind, meaning what you think you create. And so it sets up this really awkward situation that if your life is kind of a mess or if you're struggling with addiction or mental health issues or any kind of physical challenge, that it is your fault. And so that's not what I'm saying at all. That was what we call medical, metaphysical malpractice. You know, it's metaphysical malpractice that we're using the principles to sort of blame ourselves. And so we're not in that space of blaming and shaming. But what we are doing is trying to understand how is it then if I come to this right now where I'm at and I'm wanting to practice the principles, I'm wanting to become this metaphysician that I am, but there's something happening with my brain or my brain chemistry or my emotional state that's making that a bit challenging. Many of us are struggling or have struggled with mental illness. And so the science of mind and thoughts of this is about changing the mind, but it's also a process that has to be done very carefully, methodically, with discipline, and with care. And so I want us to think as we move through this conversation here today that I am not a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, I am not a therapist, I am not a psychologist, I don't have any kind of degrees of this sort, I'm not a therapist, but what I bring to this conversation is my own experience and what I've seen over almost 20 years in unity of how these principles, how these ideas that are perennial wisdom can change your life. They can bring you to a place where you can feel whole and healthy and happy and even zealous, zeal, joy. It may take time, but it's something that can happen. Because 
Oftentimes what we're doing when we're trying to address these things is we're struggling to fix it. Does that resonate with anyone? You're struggling to fix it. Something is wrong with me, I must fix it. And so what we're doing here today is letting that go. We are dispelling that as a flat out lie. It is something that is a condition that you are in. It is not your natural state. It is not your divine nature. You come into this iteration of life perfect, healthy, whole, healed, and guess what? Holy. So we're claiming that today, no matter what you are going through in your life, this is the truth of your being. So when we think about it, what might be some of the causes of mental health issues, right? Maybe some of us are born with it for some reason. Maybe we've incarnated. There's people that believe that we have incarnated into this life with those particular issues to be able to go through this experience, this soul experience, to learn and maybe to even help others on their spiritual journey. Maybe you're born with it because of womb trauma. Some people believe that in the womb you can't have trauma and you come into this experience of life with that. There's others that believe in the idea of intergenerational trauma. That is that you can pass through, through your DNA, issues that have happened or pre-existing conditions that change, transfer on to those after you. But here's the thing, all of those things are not fixed states. They are things that happen to us. They're conditions of us. They're not innate to us. Maybe the mental health issues you developed because of your family of origin or something that happened traumatic in your life. Maybe it's something that happened with a friend or a teacher or family members. Maybe it's some maladaptive behavior that you created to be able to survive in whatever circumstances you were in whether it was a broken you know, household or a toxic household or a violent household or community or poverty or whatever other things that we have in our lives that need adaption. We have to adapt in order to survive and so sometimes they're maladaptive behaviors. Or maybe some of us think of having somehow an unbalanced brain chemistry. All of these things we can talk about as part of kind of a mental health way that we're approaching when we come to situations. Some of us will use the principles and can use the principles to heal and maybe fully heal. Some of us will come to this and learn to control. See, sometimes we think we have to get rid of everything, like we're not complete if we don't let go of those things. And some of it, it's just like those of us who come from a 12-step, we know that that's that part of us, right? But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing for us. It's just acknowledging that there might be parts of us that are still there, but we can control it. We can use our higher self to lead, right? And some of us may still be in the struggle and may continue to be in the struggle and be in the struggle. I think I feel like I lost this. Here we go. And be in the struggle for some time. I know it's hard to hear, but we are all on this journey for a purpose. And so wherever you're at, wherever you're going to be at in the days and weeks to come, it's all good and it's all God. And I know that sounds so hard to hear if you're struggling. But that is the truth. You are never alone and you are never going to be in a universe that is wanting to punish you. You are in a loving universe that wants to bring you to your greatest and highest good. You are in a universe that is guiding and loving and protective and protecting of you. So all of the messages that you've heard in the past about needing to be punished or needing to be fixed or needing to give a penance or needing to do something to be given the grace of God is a lie. You come into this iteration of life being the hands and the feet and the voice of God. And by that, that means that you are anointed. Just because I am standing here and I've gone to school and ministerial school doesn't make me any more anointed than any 
of you all. All of us are anointed. The struggle, really, or the challenge, really, or the process, really, is the allowing of that understanding that you are anointed. You know, I was thinking about my one-year anniversary here, and I was thinking about coming into unity. It's sort of like all these I, um, emotions were sort of flooding in about what my journey has been. And it might sound strange, but I really had forgotten that part of my journey into unity started with my own mental illness. I've talked a lot from the platform about things, how I came into unity, but I had forgotten that much of what might clouded my story or colored my story or made my story really what it is in unity was the fact that I was depressed. I had lost my grandmother one year, and then the next year, and around the same time, the holidays, I ended up splitting with my daughter's other mother. And that was a tumultuous time, so I'm having one trauma on top of the next. And that sort of opened up this space for probably trauma that I had never dealt with in my life. And so I found myself really sad, really depressed, not being able to just do basic things. You know, there's part of me even that is still working through the shame and blame of not being the mother that I wanted to be to my daughter. But that is the truth. And so I came into unity and started all of these wonderful ideas sort of became this, this metaphysical soup, this healing soup that I sort of started to simmer in to be able to understand, how do I change my life? Because I knew I wanted to change my life. Hell, I knew I had to change my life. I had a three-year-old who de deserved something more than just this shell of a mother. And so I started working going to classes, going to services, working the principles, trying to find out what all of this could mean to change who I was, not who I was, but what I was living in in the moment. You know, part of that also meant that I had to be realistic about letting go the ideas of what mental illness was. You know, growing up it was sort of like, oh, that's only for crazy people. Our people don't do that kind of stuff. You know, anybody had those messages? Like, you don't go to therapy. Our people don't go to therapy. Those are for crazy people, you know? So part of it was like starting to go into talk therapy. And then the decision was, do I take medication? Which I then decided that I would. I could not function. I knew that I needed to take medication to be able to just take the edge off, to be able to just do in my life. And so I started that journey fully open to what I needed to do, fully willing to just let go and be humble to be able to heal. And so in that time, my first therapist said, I don't know if you know this, you know, and then I was diagnosed, right? She said, you have what's classic dysthymia. And so dysthymia, I will, what was explained to me in the easiest way I'll explain it to you is like an emotional flat line. Like you don't get excited about anything, you don't get sad about anything, you're just sort of like in an emotional flat line to cope, you know? That was my way of coping. Like I didn't get super excited, I didn't get super sad, it was like middle course, middle course, middle course. But then what did that mean? That meant that I couldn't really experience fully the polars of life which is part of a full, dynamic, emotional kind of way of being, right? Unity, I've said time and time again, and I will com continue to say, saved my life. Applying the principles saved my life. Because part of what the understanding was was that the things that we've been told are truly lies. In this book, you know, I love Myrtle Fillmore um, talking about how she healed herself. This book becomes a blueprint for each person here to understand what does it take to really heal your life. You know, she started being told that she was sick, that she would not last a, a certain amount of years, that she would never live a full life. And so she ended up 
going to a lecture of a physician that was also, he was a medical doctor, but also a metaphysician. He believed in new thought principles. Something in her stirred, and she began this journey that now ends up, you know, 100 plus years later becoming unity. She healed her body, but it took two years of dedicated practice. And so that's why I say we, we ta it takes time. And it takes discipline and it takes that willingness to just keep trying and to keep trying and to keep affirming and to keep praying and to keep searching for the support of others, even though you may still see that you are where you thought you started. There's been no movement. You keep going. It's the lie. And there's a story in the Bible, and because of time, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but it's both in Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8. And it's where Jesus heals, they call it the, Jesus heals a Gerasene demoniac. Do y'all remember that? Oftentimes when we hear in the Bible about Jesus cast out the demons, right? They had demons, right? It's not, think about what he's saying. Think about what this is saying biblically. If you look into the deeper meaning, this man had, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit. He stepped out on the land, this is Jesus, and he had the demons that met with him. Now the demon for a long time wore no clothes, and he did not live in the house but in tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commended the unclean spirits to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, these Demons had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wild. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. Does that sound like some sort of diagnosis? When you have maybe multiple personalities or you have other voices in your head that are telling you to do something that is counter to what you know is productive or true or healthy. It's not demons that we're looking at here necessarily. It's this idea of demons as the thoughts in our minds that we need to cleanse. The ideas that are against the truth of our nature that we need to cleanse. And so Jesus opens up this portal for him of healing and then he ends up sort of letting that go and becoming cleansed. And towards the end of the story it says, Jesus found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus. So the people, rather, found him sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Now, metaphysically, when we see in the Bible that there's something about clothing, I love my clothing, right? But it's also something so powerful. Anytime you see when the, there's a change in clothes, it's a change in outfit, meaning like this whole persona it's this change in being. It's this change in understanding. It's this change in possibility. It's like, do you put on like some fabulous outfit and you're like, ooh, I look good. Anybody? It's not just me, right? You feel that, right? You your favorite shirt or your comfy tennis shoes. Like, oh yeah, this feels awesome. It's that idea of changing the clothing to changing into who you are feeling yourself. You're feeling that energy of you and then the right mind, meaning that you're in the right mind. You're in, in alignment with the spirit. You're in alignment with God. You're in alignment with this understanding of the truth of your being. You're not in all of these other things, all of these other diagnoses, all of these other voices, all of these other ideas that people have given you about who you are. That is not necessarily who you are. I want to take this into a time of meditation. So I'm going to invite you all to just close your eyes and invite John to come up. I know some of this is heavy, y'all. And so we close our eyes and just open up taking some beautiful, deep cleansing breaths. Just allowing for that uncomfortability, allowing for maybe that confusion, allowing for those voices that says, I'm not sure what she's talking about. This doesn't resonate for me. Yes, that makes sense, but what about my situation? It's not the same. Or that will never be me. Or how can I get there? 
Allow those voices to just quiet for a second. Allowing the breath to breathe you. And as you allow the breath to breathe you, you allow for that understanding to open. That just as you breathe, spirit is there. Just as you breathe without thought, as all of that oxygen fills your lungs at every millisecond in time, spirit is there within you, freely flowing, freely gifting you with grace. And so we open up to that one presence and that one power that lives and moves and breathes in us as us and we open up to that potential and we allow for the Holy Spirit to have its way this morning to engage all of the faculties in your process of healing to engage everything that you are everything that you've been everything that you've come here to be saying you are healthy you are healed you are whole and you are holy and you are a child of God and you do not inherit sickness you are a child of God you are a child of God worthy worthy of everything Allow that to just set in you. Allow that to roll around in the recesses of your mind and your soul. You are worthy. You are healthy. You are perfect. You are joyous, zealous. You have come here in this iteration of life to do amazing things. Breathe that in. And we allow a moment in the silence, just allow that to download and upload. Breathing in and breathing out. We give thanks for this time. We give thanks for all that energy that is with us here today that is allowing that portal of healing to mightily open as we let go of false beliefs, as we let go of the blockages, as we open up to the truth of our being. You know, Myrtle Fillmore, I'm going to, in a chapter called Be Made Whole, page 132, those of you who might have the book or will have the book, This is what she says. It is up to you to accept your God-given perfection for yourself. Put aside the past mistakes and untrue suggestions and fix your undivided attention upon the creator of your inner pattern of perfection. This is a secret of success in all spiritual treatments. You must bring all of your mental attitudes, the centers of your consciousness, and even your physical structures to this high place in divine mind where you see as God sees. Where you see as God sees. And that means you see yourself as God sees. In this spiritual viewpoint, you are able to name all that is within you according to the pattern of spirit. Thus, you are able to use these soul qualities to outpicture rightly their true creative possibilities. What is she saying? She's saying that you just, we have it within us, that we use that power within us to be able to allow. You know, every illness, Myrtle Fillmore believes, is just the soul spirit acting on your behalf. I like to think of it as like a spiritual nudge. Those of us who may be having some mental illness or physical illness, it is just a holy nudge that is like, you are a child of God. I'm ushering you into a new iteration of life here. Middle Fillmore says it's about a hungering and a thirsting for righteousness, which is the righteousness of the God within. She says it's a soul trying to find its wings, trying to realize the wholeness in Christ. The wholeness not in Jesus Christ, the wholeness in the Christ mind, the wholeness in the Christ perfection, the wholeness in the Christ idea, not in Jesus. So it's that trying to find that. 
One important thing that I want to leave you with we have to remember that the things in our life that we go through, we cannot call them terrible things. I have this affliction and it's horrible, or I have this pain and it's debilitating. Words have power, they have energetic resonance and so when we're claiming them, we're giving them power. I have this condition, I have this situation, I am not a mental illness. Do you understand the difference? It's that I am depressed because you're claiming that depression as innate to your being, which is not true. I have a condition. However you want to language it, but be careful about how you're languaging it so that you're not giving power to something and claiming something, a terrible thing. There is allness in every illness. Say that with me. There is allness in every illness. Meaning that God is not, not present there. No matter who you are, what you're going through, spirit is there, God is there, universal is wisdom is there, universal intelligence, energetic resonance, whatever you want to call the higher power of your understanding, it is there always. It is never, you can't divide it from that. It is the normal condition of who we are. So I invite you all to pray and to meditate, to affirm, get an affirmation for yourself, practice it daily, seek support, your friends, your family, your church family, grief groups, there's a grief group starting by Jim Kelly here next month, correct Jim, next month. Seek out professionals and apply the principles. I'm not, it's not one or the other, but I'm saying to you that these things work if you work them. And sometimes things happen that are beyond what we would think could be. On Wednesday night, we received news that my wife, Veronica's father, had transitioned. We later found out that not only did he transition, but it turned out he committed suicide. So that was a lot to deal with having to think about what does this mean for the principles? How do we understand that? You know, oftentimes I say spirit will give you something to make you get those finer nuggets of what all this means. She wanted me to share this with you all because she wanted us to understand that there has for too long been a shame around this idea of mental illness and that until we begin allowing for that truth to just speak itself, we will continue to be in these states where we cannot be in our true power. Her father asked her, as his dying wish, to not go to Mexico. He said that he didn't want her to go there on this occasion that was so tragic, that he wanted her to maintain her idea of Mexico and of him and of their hometown in that energy. And so, again, what is the right thing to do? How do we engage? What do we do? Some of you have asked what you all may know and asked what you can do. And so at this point, honestly, we don't know. I know one of the things that we've talked about which was unknown to us at the time is that the state that she's in, that is the Mexican state of Guanajuato, where her family's from, has the third highest suicide rates in the entire country of Mexico. What's happening there, we don't know. But again, it's part of this energetic kind of energy that is there that he's sort of in that. It calls the question, you know, are we broken? What is healing? What condition do I have or what is the way that I deal with others? And so I invite those of you who may be caregivers for those who have mental illness or those of you who engage with others to remember the principles call for you to see people as the child of God, not their illness. No matter what is happening, you remember that. 
You call forth that energy, that wisdom. You see vision in your mind, the truth of who they are as a child of God. Because oftentimes we get stuck in all of that in seeing the circumstances and seeing the lack of hope and seeing all of this, maybe the hospitalizations, and so we get overwhelmed. But I implore you all, continue on the sacred journey of truth. No matter what happens, no blame, no shame. Is that making sense to folks? We continue to be who we have been called to be no matter what is happening in our life. I want to share in closing something that came to mind shortly before I came up here. And I remember that it was a post that Marsha put on our Facebook page that got 120 shares. We're lucky if we get two shares, frankly. 120 shares, and I remembered that post and I started frantically finding it. And this is what it said, breathe, let go of fear, you're fine just the way you are. The world doesn't need perfect people. It needs people who've fallen and gotten back up, people who have felt the pain and let it make them wiser and more compassionate, and it needs people who know how to create beauty out of ugliness. You my friend, are exactly what the world needs. You may be scarred and weary, and you may not be where you want to be right now, but you've survived this long. That means that you have the wisdom and the strength and the fortitude to make your part of the world a bit more perfect. Okay. Now exhale. Feel that courage soar, soar, surge. Feel it surge through you. And now go be amazing. Go be amazing. Who is ready to go be amazing? Go be freaking amazing. Know the truth of who you are. You are not your conditions and circumstances. There is allness with every illness. And so it is, and so we let it be. Amen.